Well, you can once again turn to the book of Zephaniah. This will be the last message uh, that I will bring you from Zephaniah. So, as Tommy and Corey could probably tell you, uh, I've probably learned way more than you have. Uh, It's been a good study for me, and I only hope the Lord can use it to encourage you, to teach you, to challenge you, to exhort you when needed, and uh, I trust that he has uh, used that for all of us. So today we're in Zephaniah chapter 3, uh, focusing on 9 through 20, but I'm going to go ahead and read 8 with it, because uh, that's where we left off last time. So we'll read the passage, we'll pray, and uh, we'll go from there. Zephaniah chapter 3, starting in verse 8. Therefore, wait for me, declares the Lord, for the day when I rise up to seize the prey. For my decision is to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms, to pour out upon them my indignation, all my burning anger. For in the fire of my jealousy, all the earth shall be consumed. For at that time, I will change the speech of the peoples to appear speech, that all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve him with one accord. From beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshipers, the daughter of my dispersed ones, shall bring my offering. On that day you shall not be put to shame because of the deeds by which you have rebelled against me. For then... I will remove from your midst your proudly exalted ones, and you shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain. But I will leave in your midst a people humble and lowly. They shall seek refuge in the name of the Lord. Those who are left in Israel, they shall do no injustice and speak no lies. Nor shall there be found in their mouth a deceitful tongue. For they shall graze and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The king of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion, let not your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. I will gather those of you who mourn for the festival so that you will no longer suffer reproach. Behold, at that time I will deal with all your oppressors and I will save the lame and gather the outcast. And I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time, I will bring you in. At that time, when I gather you together, for I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. It's the word of the Lord. Let us pray this morning. Uh, 
oh almighty God, we do praise you and we, we thank you and we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We praise you that your salvation does reach to the ends of the earth and it's still reaching to the end of the earth. And we pray that you would continue to strengthen our brothers and sisters that we know and support to the ends of the earth. We pray for the Risleys in Spain and the Housleys in Papua New Guinea. We pray for the uh, Santiago Baptist Church in the Philippines and, and many others that, that we know and uh, pray for and support in many other countries, Lord. We thank you for the opportunities that you give us uh, to pray and support brothers and sisters in Christ all over our world. We thank you for the opportunity you gave to Corey and, and Barry to speak boldly for your name and to teach your word. And we pray for more opportunities. We pray for opportunities you've given us in Jordan. And uh, we just praise you and thank you for that. We pray that your gospel and your word would go forth in our like-minded churches, in our, in our uh, area here near Houston. And Lord, we pray for all the churches around us and in our nation that your word would go forth, that you would change hearts, that you would redeem a people for yourself, O oh God. Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters that are uh, in Florida that, uh, that are suffering, that have, that have lost much. And yet we know, Lord, that they have a hope in you. So, Lord, we do pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ, that you would comfort them and give them strength and remind them to put their hope in you. Lord, we pray for those that have lost much that are that do not know you, Lord, that you would use this to draw them unto you, unto yourself. Draw them to Christ, that they may believe and be saved. Lord, we pray that your gospel and your word would go forth among us this morning. Lord, continue to change us and transform us into the image of Christ. We pray for Patricia Hasso this morning that you would give her strength and healing and, and uh, just comfort her and give her your strength uh, this morning. Lord, help us to be affected by your word. Help us to find our joy in you. Change our speech into a pure speech, O oh God. Help us to worship and serve you together. Continue to teach us to how to do that, how to, how to love and serve you and how to love and serve one another. Show us areas where we need to turn, to turn to you and repent. Lord, help us to understand more and more who you are and help us to understand more and more about ourselves and about our sin and how we should hate it. Help us to understand or remind us, Lord, how you poured out your wrath upon Christ. And help us to flee to Christ and to put our hope in Christ. And help us not to live in fear, but to live boldly for you. Amen. So, Zephaniah chapter 3. We ended last time on the idea... 
or I tried to throw it in there anyway at the end. <laughs> we ended last time the idea of waiting on God. Waiting on God from verse 8 there of chapter 3. Therefore wait for me, declares the Lord, for the day when I rise up to seize the prey, for my decision is to gather nations, to assemble nations, and to pour out my indignation, all my burning anger, the fire of my jealousy. All the earth shall be consumed. And uh, verse 8 there, the Lord says, wait for me. So the question is, why? Why should we wait? Well, in verses 8 through 10, we see two reasons to wait on God. Number one, the Lord's purpose in punishing all the wicked of the earth. And yes, uh, I know that the book of Zephaniah, we, we've seen already that uh, he is going to judge the, the Judah, the southern kingdom. Babylon will come and judge Judah, God's own people. But it's also a type or a picture or a shadow, if you want to call it that, uh, of the ultimate judgment of the, of the whole earth, which we know has not happened yet. And so, we know that the Lord's purpose is to punish the wicked of the earth. So, that's one reason to wait on God. Another is that it, uh, is we see the Lord's promise to create a community of worshipers. And He is already doing that. And he will continue to do that. And ultimately, he will do that. He will create a community of worshipers from, from all nations. And uh, we will see that uh, in these verses. So we are to wait, but waiting is not easy, is it? Waiting is not easy. Uh, perhaps you've... Uh, had plans where you are lo really looking forward to, to doing something. But you have to wait till that day comes. You mark it on the calendar. Maybe you count down the days. I know that uh, uh, we've had times in our family where we've counted the days to Christmas Day or maybe a family trip that we've planned or wh whatever it may be. And waiting is some is is it's not easy. In fact, during that time where we're waiting, uh, we many temptations may come along. Many temptations uh, uh, that uh, tempt you to quit or just kind of take it easy. We just kind of we get a little lazy or we take it easy in our waiting. Or maybe we have doubts. Will that day really come? Or maybe we are tempted to compromise uh, our, our way of living. Or we get anxious. Or we even fear. What if it doesn't come? What if it doesn't come? And yet, we know in the in the Christian life, we, we do need to wait for the Lord. The Lord will accomplish all these things that he is saying in, in the book of Zephaniah here. Many of the things he has accomplished, his judgment on Judah, but again, the picture or the type of the judgment that is coming on the whole earth, whole earth the whole world, is, is not happened yet, and we are still waiting and how should we live? Well, we know how we should live. We should, be, we should be walking in the Lord's ways, living for Him, living for His glory. And yet many times we forget. We get busy or, again, we, we have these temptations to take it easy, to quit, to get lazy. And yet we know the crown of life is before us. 
The crown of life is before us. I want to read to you uh, James chapter 1 and verse 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Oh, that's a great reason to, to wait on the Lord. And as we're waiting to continue to walk in him. How about 2 Peter 2.9? You don't have to turn there. I'll turn there. 2 Peter 2.9. Then the Lord then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment and especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority so he knows that he there is coming a day of judgment but he also knows how to rescue the godly from trials and so With that in mind, that should give us motivation to be good waiters. Waiters like waiting on the Lord is what I mean. (laughs) I think you knew that. 1 Peter 5.10. 1 Peter 5.10. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. And so why should we wait? We have reasons right there. We have reason in Zephaniah, and we have reasons in the, in the New Testament, in the Scriptures, why we should wait. God has called us to eternal glory in Christ. And if we are forgetting, if we are forgetting God's word and our eyes are only on ourselves, well, of course, waiting is not easy. And we are going to be bombarded with temptations to doubt and compromise and fear and to be anxious and to take the easy way out. So let us encourage one another with God's word and with his promises. So we see those two reasons to wait on God, the Lord's purpose to punish all the wicked, and the Lord's promise to create a community of worshipers. Let's move on to to verses 9 and 10, and we'll see a little bit about that promise to create a community of worshipers. For at that time... I will change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech, that all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve him with one accord. And there you'll see in that verse, it talks about pure speech, that all, why? Uh, God is changing their speech into a pure speech. Why? That all of them may call on the name of the Lord. And here we have, it, it, it doesn't really say this here, but uh, when, we, when we study other scriptures, and we study the scriptures as a whole, we have the connotation that there will be a heart change, not only a, a change of speech, but a heart change, because the heart must change the way we speak. If there's going to be a change uh, in the way we speak, There must be a heart change. A transformation of the heart results in the changed speech. So what what is the Lord really talking about here? He's talking about, about transformation. He's talking about salvation for these people. And then, that last little part, that all of them may call upon the name of the Lord... And serve him with one accord. Serving together. God is uniting hearts. He's going to unite hearts and he's, he's doing that right now. Doing that right now in his local churches. 
We are one of those. The church is a spiritual household. Let us be reminded that it is a spiritual household and not just a sort of a Walmart where we come and get what we want and what we need and we leave. Sometimes it's hard to be a family. <laughs> all of you, no, well you, all of you grew up in a family. It's hard sometimes to be a family. Sometimes we don't want anyone checking in on us. We get tired of that. Accountability is uh, sometimes very hard. And, but we need it. We need it for our growth. We need it. And that's what we're, call, we're called to. We're called to uh, be accountable for each other. And sometimes that's... Uh, uh, it's just uh, just hard. It's hard to confront someone maybe when we maybe we see them struggling with a certain sin. I mean, it's hard enough to confront our own family members, or for me, it's hard enough to confront my own sons or daughters with something that I see. I might be afraid of what they're going to think or how they're going to react. There we get back to fear of man. Many times I'm afraid of man, but I should be more afraid of God and his word. So it's a good question for all of us. How, how, are, how are we doing there? How are we doing with, with uh, serving him with one accord? Are we, are we learning to do that? Or are we just kind of coming? We get what we want and we leave. Well, I know that going to church for me for many years was like that. Where I would just come, get what I want or what I feel like or whatever, I, and, and I leave. But that's not what the Lord intends for us in His, in his body. So let us all uh, uh, be encouraged and be challenged and be exhorted to what the Lord is, is calling us to. Even the qualifications for elders and deacons talk about how one manages his family. So it's a family model. Our, the, the church is a, it's a spiritual household. It's a family model. Uh, but it's hard sometimes. But let us be encouraged and uh, continue on that path that he has given us. Well, let's move to per, uh, verse 10. It's the, it's, uh, I'm including it with that promise to create a community of worshipers. Again, those two reasons to wait on God, that the Lord's purpose is to punish all the wicked of the earth and the Lord's promise to create a community of worshipers. Look at verse 10. From beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshipers, the daughter of my dispersed ones, shall bring my offering. If you'll remember back in chapter 2, verse 12, chapter 2, verse 12, we, Cush was given uh, a pronouncement of judgment. But now there's going to be worshipers from there that will be saved. A remnant will be saved. Do you think... And I, I, I think so. But do you think that Luke knew Zephaniah when he wrote the book of Acts and included his account of the Ethiopian eunuch? I think he did. Of course, I think God, I mean, we all know, I mean, it's God's word. He's orchestrating it all together. But I think Luke knew Zephaniah, this small book with only three chapters to us. Not sure that it had chapters when Luke was looking at it, but uh, 
That's just awesome. I think it's just awesome as you study more and more of the Old Testament and the New Testament and how it all fits together and how the Lord fits it all together, has fitted it all together. But the scriptures in Zephaniah uh, show how the spreading of the gospel and the church is, is being fulfilled, will be fulfilled. As, as Tommy says often, and I think Corey says it too, the already but the not yet. God is doing this already but not yet totally and 100% fulfilled. So we rejoice that the church, the New Testament church, is fulfilling the Old Testament hopes for a single reconciled community that will be from every tribe and tongue. And so he's, he's doing it. And we even see it in the book of Acts. And he's continuing that even in our day and and it will come about perfectly one day. So we seem, uh, let's move on to verses 11 to 13. We seem to shift back to a focus on Jerusalem. Where we see a renewal of Jerusalem. Verses 11 through 13. On that day you will not be put to shame. Jerusalem will no longer be put to shame. Because of the deeds by which you have rebelled against me. For then I will remove from your midst your proud, proudly exalted ones. You shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain. So God will expel the proud. There is no room for, for haughtiness. The remnant will be saved. So, yes, he will expel the proud. And what will he leave? What will he leave there? Look at verse 12. I will leave in your midst a people humble and lowly. Don't we have to be humble and lowly to even come to Christ? God must get rid of our, our haughtiness, our pride. There is no other way. We must seek refuge in the name of the Lord. That's what, again, it says in verse 12. They shall seek refuge in the name of the Lord. The Lord here is, is, is showing his salvation. Saving his, his, the city that he has judged. All of that judgment that was poured out upon Judah is now the Lord is, is changing them, saving them, transforming them. Verse 13, those who are left in Israel, they shall, they shall do no injustice. Oh, they were caught in so much injustice in the previous chapters. We've, we, we've talked about that. We've covered it. They were caught in lies. Even their leaders, the priests and their officials, caught in lies they were full of deceit, taking advantage of one another. But now there will be no injustice and no lies and no deceit. And as uh, many other, uh, as many other uh, scriptures, we see a picture in, at the end of verse 13 there. We see a picture of them lying down uh, and... Uh, at peace, and none shall make them afraid. Sort of like a, a picture of a flock of sheep. For they shall graze and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. We're familiar with Psalm 23. I'm not going to read it right now, but you can write that down and read it later if you wish. If you're not familiar with Psalm 23. John chapter 10 also shows us this picture of Jesus being the great shepherd to his, to his flock. So again, so if, if you're not familiar with Psalm 23 and John 10, write those down in your notes and go back and read them uh, today. 
or sometime this week. And so we see a picture of God's salvation and transformation there. And remember how this comes about. How does it come about? Does God just all of a sudden do it? Look at verse 15. I'm going to skip ahead to 15. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. Does, does he just, just take them away? Just like he created out of the air? Or how does this happen? Well, remember all the judgment that was to be poured out on Jerusalem. All the darkness, the distress, the ruin, the devastation, the gloom, the anguish. All of that judgment that we talked about back in especially chapter 1, verse 15 and 16. All of those uh, adjectives that describe the day of judgment. Remember, all of that was poured out on Christ. All of that judgment was poured out on Christ for his people. That should be a reason for us to wait on the Lord. And while we're waiting to serve him, to walk in his ways. So some questions here at the end of verse 13. Uh, we've kind of finished the section here of 9 to 13. Have you or do you call on the name of the Lord? Do you serve in his church? Or are you just kind of coming to Walmart? Has God conquered your pride? Does he continue to conquer your pride? Has there been a pervasive change in your life? Are you calling out for mercy or crying for his mercy? Do you at least have the desire to live a holy life? To follow in his ways? Good questions for all of us. As we move on to verse 14, verse 14, we have a little bit of a, uh, a change here. We have a call to rejoice, a call to rejoice. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel. Why? Why should we rejoice and shout? We, we don't do that here. We don't shout, do we? And there you go. Thank you, James. <laughs> Amen. So, we, it, it gives us here a reason why we sing and shout. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. Why? Verse 15 tells us, the Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. All those enemies that we talked about to the, to the uh, west and to the east and to the south and to the north. All those enemies are cleared away. The king of Israel, the Lord, and this may be the most important reason. The king of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. We can be with our Lord and Savior. You shall never again fear evil. So we see all those judgments taken away. And again, remember, they, they didn't just go away for us on our side of, of the cross. They, they, they went upon Jesus Christ. He took all of God's wrath for us. The Lord has taken away the judgment. He's cleared away the enemies. The king is in their midst. God with us. We shall never again fear evil. You'll remember when Adam and Eve sinned, what did they do? They hid. They hid from God. 
And I think sometimes we still have a tendency to do that too. We want to hide. We want to hide our sin or we want to hide from God. Or to cover up that sin, we have to sin more over here or over there. We have to sin more and more and more like David did. The relationship is broken. But remember that the relationship is restored in salvation when we are in Christ. And so we have that as, a, as encouragement. Do you, believer, if you are a believer in this room today, do you have joy in the Lord? We should. So I prayed for those brothers and sisters in Christ that are in Florida. We have brothers and sisters that are in Christ, and yes, they are, they've, they've had trouble, much trouble. But they have a reason to rejoice this morning. They have a reason to take comfort and have joy in the Lord. And so let's pray for them in that way. But there are many that do not have that hope. There are many that do not have that hope. Let us pray for them that they will come to the Lord. So, more reasons to rejoice. Let's keep going to verse 16. More reasons to rejoice. The Lord has taken away judgments, cleared enemies. The king is in our midst. We shall not fear evil. In verse 16, on that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, let, your, let not your hands grow weak. Be strengthened, in other words. In the Hebrew, that's sort of like a temporary paralysis. That word, that let your hands grow weak or feeble. Sort of like a temporary paralysis. But here it's saying, let not your hands grow weak. In other words, be strengthened. Serve the Lord. I can remember specifically, uh, and I'll never forget it. Something that Leslie taught us. Many of you don't know Leslie from England. But he said, when you find yourself uh, struggling with a sin, or maybe you're caught in a sin, or however you want to describe it, get serving. Serve. Serve the Lord and serve someone else. It'll get your mind and your eyes and your heart off of yourself. I'll never forget that. So here we have, let not your hands grow weak. Be strengthened and, and start serving. Find a, a place or find someone to serve. Get your eyes off yourself. And then we come to verse 17, which... Uh, you find uh, verse 17 on the cover of the worship guide today, an awesome verse. The Lord your God is in your midst. We have that said again, a second time here in this section. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save he will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. And I couldn't find, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, you'll, you'll have to tell me. You'll have to teach me. But I'm not sure there's any other place in the Bible where it has God singing over us. I'm not sure there's any other place in the Bible that has that. If there is, you come show it to me because... I'll learn, I'll learn from you. But isn't that awesome? I mean, throughout the scriptures, you see countless numbers of, of commands for us to praise the Lord, and we should. He is worthy of all of our worship. We should exalt over the Lord. We should be rejoicing in what the, over, over who the Lord is and what he's done, and we should sing out for joy. But here in verse 17, he exalts over us. 
his people. And that's not to puff us up, but it's to comfort us and to to give us encouragement and to give us uh, hope and joy in him. As believers, we should have joy in the Lord. And so, I encourage all of us, let's sing out, let's sing to the Lord as he sings over us. What an awesome thought that he has, the, he delights in us. It's like a, a mighty warrior that is about to be married. It gives us the picture of, of of a mighty warrior about to take his bride. I don't know, uh, men uh, that are married, how you were when you got married, but that was an awesome day. But if you look in verse 17, in the Hebrew, and I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but many times, or I guess I could say usually, The word to show God's unfailing love is the word hesed, H-E-S-E-D. But the word here that is used is ahaba. I don't know if I say that right. Forgive me if I say it wrong. A-H-A-B-A, which shows a passionate love. It's the same word. Uh, There's other examples in scriptures that uses the same word. Jacob's love for Rachel. Oh, and we know that Jacob loved Rachel. He worked 14 years for her. Thought he was just going to work seven, but then he got tricked. Worked seven more. And I think the scripture says those days were like nothing to him because he loved Rachel. How about uh, Jonathan for David? It's the same word. Jacob for Joseph. It's the same word. And in Psalm 119, whoever wrote Psalm 119, he felt the same way about God's law. This passionate love like a mighty warrior would have for his bride. It's that same word. And that same word is what, how God feels about us. Wow, that should give us comfort and encouragement in the Lord. And so as we come to the end of the book of Zephaniah... In verses 18 through 20, we see that God is speaking in the first person again. In fact, there are six I wills. Uh, I will gather, I will gather those who mourn for the festival you will, so that you will no longer suffer reproach. Another I will found in 19, I will deal with all your oppressors. I will save the lame and gather the outcast. I will change their shame into praise. I will bring you in. In verse 20, it says, I will bring you in. In the time when I gather you, I gather you together and I will make you renowned and praised. So these are things that the Lord will do. And if God says it in his word, he is going to do it. So, I know that this, this, is, this is a promise for Judah, the southern kingdom, but it's also a promise for his people in the end, on that day. On that day when he comes to judge, but remember also on that day, he comes to get his own. He is already doing these things, but they are not yet fully finished. And so we wait. We wait for him. And we know 
Look how the book ends. The last three words, how the book ends, says the Lord. He will do it. So, just as we see what the Lord has done and will do with the people of Judah, he will do for his church. He will do for his church. His saving work, his saving work is greater than all of our sins. His saving work is greater than our emotions, greater than our enemies, greater than our reputation. Our reputation, which is as we know, like filthy rags anyway. He transforms us. Are you indifferent to this great work? How can you sit there today and be indifferent to it? Or are you amazed? I ask you, will you delight in the Lord? Will you stand fearless and persevere in hope? In the Lord. For the Lord has already, as we know from the scriptures, done great things. Look at Colossians 2 15. He has disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them. That's Colossians 2 15. And then I'm going to end with Romans chapter 8. All of these things that we've learned about from the book of Zephaniah, what does it, what does it cause you to do? I hope that, it, that you are just not sitting there indifferent. Romans 8, verses 31 to 37. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. Remember all of those, those words that we've talked about, about judgment, came upon Christ. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? who is at the right hand of God, who is interceding for us. And we know that he is coming again one day, on that day. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And remember, in Zephaniah, he loves us with ahaba, passionate love. Let's pray. Oh, Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your promises. We we thank you that you will do what your word says. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ who took upon all of your anger and wrath and jealous fire Christ took upon all of that in our place. May it affect us so that we repent and run to Christ. And those of us who are in Christ, may we just find our our encouragement and joy in Christ. Encourage us to keep walking, to keep waiting for that day. In the meantime, Lord, as we wait, help us to walk in your ways and live for your glory. Amen.